It was before the personal computer came along, and yet it was produced on a desktop computer with eight inch floppy disks. Um, that computer had, get this, 56K <laughs> of memory, 16-bit memory to be sure, but 56K. And it was about the size of a bread box, had a second disk drive, uh, which was wonderful, and that little machine cost $25,000. Imagine that. <laughs> anyway, the dictionary hopes to be a practical thing. Music reference works have been waiting for the present moment in technology, but we have yet to capture them, so alas, here's yet another book in which you can read about what a German augmented six chord is, but you don't get to hear it. <laughs> And you can read what an oboe is, but you haven't the slightest idea what it sounds like. All the technologies available to now, now ought to be fundamental to any music dictionary. Unfortunately, resource constraints prevent it. And so what it takes to publish a book for ordinary mortals that they can afford to buy um, prevents a good deal of what ought to be possible, indeed is possible, in reference works of our time. The new Grove Dictionary of Music and Musicians made its online debut as Grove Music Online in January of 2001, simultaneously with the release of the 29 volumes of its second print edition, the seventh in its long history. That same month, another encyclopedia we have heard referenced several times today also went online for the first time, Wikipedia. They're exactly the same age. Grove made the bigger splash. Wikipedia's debut was at first fairly quiet, but Grove's debut was widely reviewed in music journals as well as in the mainstream press. While some critics were optimistic about the new possibilities of the online version, others were frustrated by the limitations of Grove's first platform. Much like the editors of the first American supplement, the critics weren't sure if the experiment was entirely successful. In the case of Grove Music Online, much of the anxiety was directed at the technology itself and the way in which it interacted with the content. The biggest concerns were not with the actual change in delivery model from paper to computer screen, but in what that change suggested about what matters most to us about scholarship. Some were worried that the online format represented, if not the death of carefully maintained scholarly oversight, at least the onset of its decay. Lexicography as an expression of Western value systems as old as Rousseau can perhaps be taken for granted in an assembly such as the one in which we find ourselves this morning but the attempt to engage with and map the musical experience of a nation state is much more recent in terms of ambition. And as far as I'm concerned, was not realized until the publication of the Encyclopedia of Music in Canada in 1981. In making this claim, the editors of that encyclopedia explained that it was about, quote, music in Canada and Canada's musical relations with the rest of the world, unquote. I was a graduate student in Toronto when the Encyclopedia of Music in Canada appeared, and the thought struck me almost as soon as I saw it that a similar ingathering of information about music in Ireland, a very small country, but one with a very long history, was overdue. 